Welcome to everyone who's joining us. Um, we're very excited about today's session. If you logged in early, we were playing the music from the Outlaw Ocean Music Project from Ian Urbina. And those tracks were from the Offshore Frontier featuring Mooncake and Distant Quiet Waters. Check them out on, uh, on Apple Music, Spotify, and the Outlaw Ocean Music Project.com. Um, okay, so I'm Anna Bradley, Executive Director of Sentient Media, and I'm co-hosting today with our wonderful editor, Matt Zampa. Uh, so for those of you who are new to Sentient Media, we report on the impact of our industrial food system on human and non-human animals, and our mission is to create more visibility around these issues in media, ideally mainstream media outlets. Um, Obviously, I can tell you in 2020, we reached 25 million people with our content, so we're pretty happy about that. Um, we published over 300 articles and served 100 writer advocates. And on that note, we've just launched our new Writers Collective, which if you're interested in joining, um, I'd like to invite you to go to our website to make your application. It's essentially an online community space uh, and learning area for advocates of all different kinds writing about uh, different social justice causes um, and in this area you can meet each other you can network uh, and you can learn how to tell better stories um, but yes on to today um, today we've got three perspectives for you on one vast topic our oceans um, we have reporter ian urbina investigator Lex Rigby and undercover investigator Pete Paxton. So thank you all for joining us. Uh, questions and answers are open throughout. So well, they should be open throughout. Um, so please pop in any questions that you have and we will get to them at the end. Hello. <laughs> so um, yeah, I mean, obviously the ocean is a really, it's an unfathomable yet beautiful place to most of us. And the reality of what happens at sea is unknown and uh, rarely reported. Um, yet, as many of us know, the ocean covers more than 70% of our planet and the aquatic creatures within it are being killed at a scale we can't comprehend. We cannot even measure the number of lives um, at sea that, that are going. So um, yeah, at the moment, more than 80% of the world's fish populations are on the brink of a collapse. So um, yeah, I mean, there's no shortage of laws governing the seas and enforcing them is obviously uh, a challenge, which we will hear from um, our speakers about today. Uh, but thanks to the people we have, thanks to people like the three speakers we have today, um, things are starting to change. So we're going to kick off with Ian. Um, hey, Ian. Uh, Ian's an investigative reporter and director of the Outlaw Ocean Project, which is a nonprofit journalism organization focusing on reporting about environmental and human rights crimes at sea. And his book, which I just happen to have a copy of sitting right here, um, The Outlaw Ocean, was originally published as a series in the New York Times. A fantastic series and a fantastic book I highly recommend. Um, Ian served as an investigative reporter for the New York Times for over two decades. Um, and during his career, he's won a Pulitzer Prize for breaking news, a George Polk Award for foreign reporting. And in the outlaw ocean, he tells many different stories, um, a lot of which are pretty troubling. So uh, there's one about the story of the Burmese uh, migrant who had been shackled by the neck on a trawler and enslaved for three years. Um, he shadowed a Tanzanian stowaway who, uh, when discovered at sea by a crew member, was set overboard on a raft and left to die. Um, he stayed on a Thai trawler with 40 Cambodian boys who worked 20 hour days barefoot, rain or shine on a slippery deck. Um, so yeah, a lot of a lot of stories there that I'm sure you can enlighten us on, Ian. But for most of us, the sea is a place, you know, where we sit and uh, relax and sunbathe, perhaps eating fish and chips with no idea where the fish came from or the life that they lived. Um, yeah, I'm curious, Ian, and obviously, from all of you, I'm curious to hear what it is that draws you to the sea and what the reality of life at sea is like as a reporter. Uh, well, thanks, Anna, um, and thank you for having me. Um, the what drew what drew me originally um, is a story that began before I joined the Times, and I was uh, working 
on a doctoral dissertation in anthropology and um, cultural anthropology. And I was procrastinating in decided fashion and took some time away from Chicago and went and worked on a ship in Singapore just to do something different other than my dissertation. And um, I kind of, um, I had, I did not grow up um, on the water. I I'd never, to this day, actually have never been on a sailing boat. I don't know how to sail. Um, I, um, but um, I was always enamored with the blue on the map and um, that exposure uh, during that grad school period to seafarers kind of anthropologically confronted me with um, uh, this invisible tribe of people, you know, that live this very different life and have kind of their own code of conduct and vocabulary and sense of time and hierarchy and crime. And um, I was sort of, you know, kind of fascinated by them. Um, and then I went to the Times and um, my mandate was to try to find journalistic virgin snow, you know, kind of topics that felt fresh and urgent. And um, uh, at one point I, I pitched um, this crazy idea of sending me to sea around the world so that I could tell stories about the intersection of human rights, labor and environment concerns out offshore. Um, so that's sort of the arc of it. Life at sea, um, uh, it's space travel on earth. You know, you're getting into this um, spaceship, you know, that is, uh, this confined setting with some other fellow travelers and you're traveling through this weird place that truly has a kind of bent laws of fiction, of uh, physics. Um, weather comes from below and above, not just above. Um, uh, the sky is bigger, the winds are stronger. Um, just things are really radically different. Um, your experience of time, the long, if you spend any real time out there, as Lex, I think, um, quite especially can tell you, uh, starts to uh, transform, even it affects your biology, you know, um, you know, you can get, as I did, you know, you can be great at being at sea and not get seasick and then come back to shore and have acute land sickness because your internal pendulum doesn't want to readjust. And so it's a really funky place, beautiful um, in many ways and addictive, but, um, uh, quite different. Thank you for sharing that. I've actually just been requested to show the book again by somebody. So I'm going to just show it again. It wasn't me, I promise. <laughs> sure, yeah, yeah. It wasn't your friends, right? Um, <laughs> mom, mom, stop. <laughs> um, I wonder if this is long enough. I'm going to... Uh, <laughs> cool. We'll be, we'll be doing a write-up and we'll, we'll put links in um, as well afterwards. Um, but thanks for that, Ian. Um, like you, you mentioned Lex, I know you and Lex spent some time at sea together as well. Um, so we're gonna move on to Lex Rigby now, head of investigations at Viva. Um, so after more than a decade of campaigning to defend, conserve and protect marine wildlife, Lex joined vegan campaigning charity Viva in 2018. Um, as head of investigations, Lex is responsible for coordinating and conducting investigations, some of which uh, we've covered at Sentient Media. A recent one was an investigation into a salmon farm off the coast of Scotland. Um, and Lex also spent time on Sea Shepherd, so with Sea Shepherd. So uh, she participated in three whale defence campaigns in Antarctica and four anti-poaching campaigns from the Southern Ocean to the North Sea, including Operation Icefish, which Ian also wrote about, uh, which got put into the New York Times. Um, Lex, thank you so much for joining us today. Really appreciate it. Um, and I want to ask you, the same thing like what is it that draws you to the to the sea and what's the reality of life like at sea as an investigator hello and thanks for having me it's really nice to actually be able to get to chat about some of these experiences again because i feel like it was such a long time ago now and i've always found it quite difficult i think to answer the question about what draws me to the sea because i grew up slap bang in the middle of england in a little village near to Stoke-on-Trent, no sea around me whatsoever, no access to the ocean. But I think what it was is as much as I would not condone keeping animals in tanks anymore, as a kid, I would spend a lot of time looking at my dad's aquarium and just 
being fascinated by all the fish that we kept in there and you know and being heartbroken every time we lost one of them and had to flush it down the toilet but really I think for a lot of us that don't have any kind of connection to the ocean a lot of our interests stems from documentaries that people like David Attenborough produce things like Blue Planet really piqued my interest I became incredibly obsessed with whales and as somebody that doesn't even condone speciesism either it's kind of hard for me to have a favorite animal but I have a whale on my wall it's is my favorite animal and it was the animal that really drew me to Sea Shepherd that I wanted to go and protect these animals that were being massacred in ridiculous numbers somewhere so far away that you, you can't actually quite comprehend how I went from Stoke-on-Trent to Antarctica but I did on numerous occasions actually to defend whales and it became my kind of driving force for any campaigning that I wanted to do was just to protect these animals that were being persecuted in such significant numbers. And I think what really got me to stay at sea for such a long time, I spent almost seven years with Sea Shepherd on the ships. And I think what it was, was I'm a creature of habit and the life that you have at sea is very regimented. And as a bridge officer, I got into a routine where, you know, my preferred navigation watches were four to six. So that meant I'd be up around half three in the morning. I'd be on the bridge between four to eight in the morning. Then I'd probably sleep till about half 10, get up, exercise. If it was warm, that would be out on the aft deck. But otherwise it'd be sort of below deck in the rope hold. And I remember like one time doing my little <laughs> exercise routine on the aft deck and there was this announcement on the loud hailer that there was a pot of wall the dolphins on the starboard side. So I was like, oh my God, who gets to say that they interrupted their exercise with a pot of dolphins on the starboard side? But anyway, it gave me the excuse not to continue exercising. After that, probably the highlight of my day would be making a coffee. Uh, lunch was always 12 o'clock so for a long time I could not get out of the habit of having breakfast 8 o'clock, lunch at 12 o'clock, dinner at 6 o'clock, standard every single day um, and then between sort of 12 and 4 in the afternoon I'd be participating in drills, I'd be reading, I'd be catching up on emails, doing paperwork for the ship and then between 4 and 8 in the evening again I'd be back on, on watch on the bridge and then probably finally in bed by about half nine in the evening. And that was my standard day. And it, it went like that for a very long time. Sounds really nice. Um, it, like that, that kind of sense of routine does sound really appealing. I guess right now with like uh, the COVID stuff, everyone's routines have kind of gone a bit AWOL. Um, so, so yeah, it's a, quite an appealing image. Although cold, I bet. Um. <laughs> Not when we were around Africa, then it was incredibly hot because we didn't even have air conditioning on the ship. So we were literally like just pouring with sweat every day. It was horrendous. I actually preferred it in Antarctica where it was obviously a lot colder because you can layer up, but when you're hot, there's not much you can do about it. <laughs> True point. <laughs> um, thank you, Lex. Great to have you with us. Um, and our third speaker is Pete Paxton. Um, so Pete has been doing animal cruelty investigations since 2001, so that's 20 years of um, undercover investigations, um, uncovering abuse at things, places like puppy mills, factory farms, slaughterhouses, commercial fishing boats and pet stores. He's worked all over the world in the US, Canada, uh, Mexico, Brazil, India, the Philippines. Uh, and more. And his work has been covered uh, in HBO documentaries, Dealing Dogs and Death on a Factory Farm. He's also the author of Rescue Dogs, which I don't have a copy of next to me, but I bet Pete does. Yeah, he does. Okay. I think you'll have to hold that up again because I don't think they can see you yet. You'll have to keep it there. <laughs> keep it there. Um, you're gonna have to send me one. Um, he's been awarded a coin of excellence from the US Attorney's Office um, of Arkansas for his role as an undercover investigator to help shut down a seller of dogs and cats to research laboratories. Um, so much of Pete's work has involved working undercover for weeks or months at a time in facilities, enabling him to understand the plight of 
undocumented immigrants exploited in agriculture um, and the factors amongst um, yeah and the fa and the factors amongst all commercial animal operations that lead to criminal behavior. Um, Pete was part of a um, big undercover investigation that actually led to the banning of gill nets um, in the state of California, which uh, Matt will dive into with Pete in a moment. Um, but firstly, Pete, show us your book and tell us a bit about um, the reality of being undercover at sea. Sure thing. Um, so after you read The Outlaw Ocean, you should read Rescue Dogs, <laughs> which I highly recommend. Great book. Um, just as good as the Outlaw Ocean. <laughs> um, um, uh, yeah, so my job is uh, primarily it, it, undercover work, um, which a large part of that has been doing employment-based investigations, meaning working undercover at puppy mills, at factory farms, at slaughterhouses, and on commercial fishing boats. Um, there's a saying that I developed, uh, which is that the best way to convince someone you are something is to actually be that thing. And it's that, you know, there came a point in time when I didn't have to, I was working on so many farms, I didn't have to convince someone that I knew what to do. I actually was a farm hand. And a few words said so much. And just how I carried myself alone was what would get me hired. And with commercial fishing, it was the same thing. You know, um, you know people, people are struggling and fighting and working for free. I, I had to help install an engine on a boat for free, you know, over, over days and days of work to try to get in uh, to a boat. And eventually um, what, had, what had helped me was being able to say, look, I am a fisherman. Like, here's my commercial fishing license. I've worked on that boat and that boat and that boat. You know, I know how to bait hooks on a long line. I know how to bring down the cork on the saner. Um, and uh, what this led to for commercial fishing specifically was that I was trying to figure out what would make the largest impact for commercial fishing that, that, I, that I just as an undercover investigator would do. And as we'll discuss shortly, um, it was realizing that there is absolutely no impact that I could have without the press being involved. And so I chose a specific fishery for a specific legislative action that I thought would have that the press would jump on to have the biggest impact for everyone. Um, and I'd also like to say very briefly, I know there's a lot of journalists that are listening. Ian, I know you're a journalist. Um, undercover work is kind of violating all the ethics in journalism because you lie, 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 lie. Um, but the, the thing about it is that if you do read The Outlaw Ocean and you do read Rescue Dogs, um, you will be able to draw a line straight through the reasons of predictable criminal activity for why there's violations in the ocean that governments and law enforcement let go, that they're aware of and that they let go, and why there's violations of the animals that we love the most, dogs. And even though the, go the government agencies and law enforcement is responsible for them, you will see, see the same reasons and it's that you know we always hear that familiarity breeds contempt right and i'd say that's true if you're talking about your personal friend who has a, a habit that annoys you but when it comes to something like commercial fishing or puppy milling or any industrial thing familiarity breeds apathy and it makes people become desensitized to things and it makes people start to accept that what is corrupt and what is unjust is what is normal and that it's harder to go up against it than, than it is to just kind of let it go. And undercover work has enabled me to be very close, personal on a first name basis uh, with people to understand the legal and the cultural reasons for why that behavior exists. That's such a good point. I hadn't maybe naively thought of that point that, um, you're violating all of the codes of journalism when you're doing this undercover um, work. It's uh, yeah, it's a really valid point. Um, I'm going to pass over to Matt now um, to go on a deep dive into setting the scene of the industrial fishing um, space at the moment. Cool. Before I get into it, I just wanted to say thanks to everybody here. There's a wealth of experience in the room. And I, I just think that's so cool. So we really appreciate you all being here. Um, and yeah, I'm excited. Uh, so much like Lex, I grew up uh, landlocked. 
I'm from the Midwest, I'm from Chicago, and issues like industrial fishing are super far from me um, and hard to relate to. Um, but, you know, I've learned a lot about them in the past few years. And, and my big learning is uh, that the industry itself, industrial fishing, is getting out of control. Um, the, I, many people may be aware of this. If you're not, it's, it's really important. Um, there are actually more fish being farmed for food now than there are being wild caught in the wild. Um, and that's changing the industry a lot. Um, it's also uh, encroaching on vital ecosystems, putting workers, as Ian has covered, workers in their communities at risk. Um, but I actually wanted to circle back to Lex, who has probably seen both sides of this coin better than most people, um, having covered, uh, you know, fishing in the wild and, and fishing on a farm. So we, we recently ran her latest investigation with Viva about uh, Scottish fish farms. And Lex, I hope, like, maybe you can tell us a little bit about, um, yeah, what, what it's like to investigate a fish farm and kind of what's different about fish farms and why are they becoming uh, more popular? Well, I think the first thing was when we actually started the planning for the salmon investigation, we knew that it was going to be logistically challenging purely because of accessing these places. It, it wasn't somewhere where you can just like open the door and walk in and, and start filming. We needed to have good weather on our side. We needed to be able to reach these farms. And, and for that, we actually ended up with an inflatable kayak, which I, you know, had bought the week before. It wasn't like I'd spent all this time kind of trying to research how to get a boat to it or anything it was literally we're either going to swim which I know some other investigators had been doing in Scotland already and I was like mm, it's mid-September it's probably gonna be a bit too cold for me to go for a swim so I want to stay dry in this instance so we ended up with this kayak anyway and again you know I thought accessing these places would require a lot of diving gear and that I'd need all this really cumbersome kit and like again I have done dry suit diving in Scotland and swam with seals and things like that and I wasn't really that confident actually about diving inside a salmon cage I just thought it was an unnecessary risk so we kind of just had this idea that we'll pack a kayak, we'll pack a few GoPros and we'll just give it a go. We'll see what we can do. We won't make any promises about this. And so what we did mid-September, we ended up spending an entire week in Scotland. And on the first day it was literally driving to these farms, seeing how close they were to shore and figuring out really if this was going to be feasible or not, or if it was just some kind of like, I don't know, stupid dream we were having that we we're ever going to reach these places. So we found one that had pretty good access. We knew that the next day would probably have good enough weather. And again, it's one of these things where when you're filming underwater, especially if you're not in the water, which is what we were, we were actually on the side of the cages filming, you don't really know what you're filming either. The light doesn't penetrate that deeply, so you know it's going to be pretty dark. We knew that the intensification of salmon farms means that you have thousands and thousands of animals all swimming together. There's excess feed in there, there's, the, you know, there's swimming in feces, there's just all this murk and muck around them that you're never going to have good visibility either. So it was one of these things where it was like, okay, the weather's against us, the water conditions against us. The fact that we've got to even kayak to it is against us. And what I really wanted to do was focus on the sea lice issue, because I think that is probably the most horrifying thing for any consumer of salmon that they don't realize that these animals are actually covered in flesh eating parasitic lice and they cause absolute devastation on salmon farms purely because the severe overcrowding of the salmon means it's just so easy for lice to live there and breed there and eat everything there and one of the things that kind of really stuck out to me and again I'd seen it in images and footage from other investigators around Scotland that have done similar work was a lot of the salmon have these like white rings around their necks and I'm like what is, what is that why do they look like that 
and they what are actually known as death crowns and it's where the lice have actually eaten away so far into the flesh that they've just got these open wounds and because of the way again that you know they, they're packed in these cages it's a breeding ground for disease so all these open wounds are just like open to infection and or fungal infection bacteria and they're just in some of the worst conditions I've ever seen animals in and I've seen a lot of really bad things in terms of animal farming and yet you know you sh you're showing these pictures to people and it doesn't create the same kind of shock and so I think what I've really wanted to do since doing the salmon investigation especially <laughs> is talk about it from a personal perspective because I think that's really what's going to resonate with people when you can say I've seen this and it's really bad and we need to start changing this now. Yeah, you did that so well for us in two different articles that we ran recently. We'll link to all of them um, when we share uh, this recording. But I, I guess it's a really personal issue, but you know, salmon farming specifically or, or fish farming in general is often sold as a more sustainable option. Um, and I wonder if you could, um, yeah, address that like it from your perspective is fish farming uh sustainable well again it, it's something that i have written about in the past because we often talk about fish farming or aquaculture as it's become known now as the solution to overfishing we know that one in three fish for example are either caught illegally or unreported or unre unregulated means at sea so there are 90% of our large predatory fish that have been completely wiped out of the ocean. And we know that two thirds have been overexploited. And it's just this thing where people are saying, well, we've overfished our oceans now. The solution isn't to stop fishing. The solution is now to farm these animals instead. And we can create these inland ponds or we can create these sea cages where we can just breed them on this enormous scale to try and, and feed this growing demand for seafood. But the thing is, a lot of, especially for the salmon, they are fish that eat fish. And so you can't feed them sustainably because you're going to overfish the ocean. You're catching wild fish to then feed farmed fish. And so it's not, <laughs> it's not the solution. And it just blows my mind, really, that people don't you know you say that to someone and they're like oh, oh yeah I didn't, I didn't think of, of that at all but it's not talked about enough we're not talking about how the vast majority of fish that were taken out of the ocean are ground into fish meal or into fish oil and that's literally just feeding our farmed animals and I remember one of the things that we would always talk about doing when Sea Shepherd had ships in their ports and we would run all these ship tours and you know, people would often ask us why the ships were vegan, why we didn't serve any animal products on board. And we would just, you know, without trying to be forceful about our kind of opinions on things, because Sea Shepherd attracts like a lot of people. They're not just, and a lot of supporters, not just from the animal rights movement or vegan backgrounds or anything. And so we get quite gently trying to say that actually farmed animals are now the ocean's largest predator. And this is the number one reason why we're not going to serve any animal products on board. And it would be quite hypocritical of us really to be out there risking our lives to save one animal whilst eating another for dinner, you know. So I think a lot of people started to make that connection afterwards. I hope so. And, you know, it's, it's a hard connection to make. I think that's something that we'll all admit. Um, but, you know, sharing your stories is a step right and making it personal and, and helping people understand that there are people you know really working on this issue um so my next question is, is still for you lex but i actually wanted to um ask ian first because i know you two work together and it's really interesting um like ian how did you meet lex and and kind of how did this story um covering sea shepherd how did it develop? You know, how did you sell it to the New York Times? That's everybody here is wondering, you know, how do I get my story into the New York Times? And we're not all Ian Urbina, but we can all take some pointers for sure. Um, so I wonder if you could kind of give us a, uh, yeah, like a, a rundown of like uh, how that story developed. Yeah, sure. I mean, um, 
so unfortunately my answer won't be that useful to the way the questions framed because I was on staff at the New York Times so that's I wasn't pitching externally you know I was um, uh, salaried and could only write for them exclusively and and um, my job was to I was an investigative project reporter so every year or two years I had to come up with some new grand series or one big deep dive piece um, so um, and, and this series was a uh, you know, a, a proposed um, project that would look at um, the human rights and environmental, the diversity of human rights, environmental concerns um, offshore. And really, um, there were a couple of core methodological ambitions in the way it was framed. One was we wanted, um, we wanted to do things a little bit differently. One, we didn't want to write the stories on land. We really wanted to, um, for every story, have me at sea to, to some degree and tell them um, with a firsthand kind of vicarious potential. Um, uh, because there had been, and there still is, and the, the um, good reporting, um, but a lot of it was occurring on land. A lot of it was also very focused, in, in my view and in my editor's view, myopically from an environmental point of view. And I, having been someone who comes at things you know historically from a human rights labor point of view first environmental second didn't want to write an, an ocean um, series about uh, marine concerns I, I wanted to write a series about um, the ocean um, as many things including a workplace where 56 million people are out there uh, doing various things um, and uh, their real dire worries about those folks and their well-being, and then use that as a way to get into some of the environmental and marine concerns. Um, uh, so that was the second goal. Um, with regard to the the, the specific piece, um, Operation Icefish, where um, I met Lex, is that right, Lex? Because I've been on a bunch of different, you know, um, Sea Shepherd, uh, even just last year. Um, but yeah, so Operation Icefish, um, this was, uh, this epic um, campaign that Lex proudly was a part of and, and Sea Shepherd ran for quite some time. Um, and it was very distinct in my view and um, from prior campaigns they'd done. And it had a kind of singular goal of um, highlighting um, the sort of uh, core um, duplicity and the way that um, there are these rules out there, but governments aren't really doing much to police them and enforce them. And indeed, there are even this purple list that Interpol kept, which was essentially an arrest on site list of vessels that had been engaged for long periods of time in well documented crimes, you know, uh, illegal fishing and overfishing crimes. And, and Sea Shepherd wanted to sort of show the world that, A, these guys are findable and catchable. And um, rather than ramming them, you know, in kind of the, the whale wars model, the, the goal in this campaign was to shame them, embarrass them, harass them, and, and embarrass the sort of broader global public that, you know, here they are and we're chasing them and um, we're going to make it hard for them to offload their ill-gotten gain, you know, into ports. Um, so I had gotten a heads up that I had a source at Interpol who I told early on in the Owl Ocean um, reporting that I was on the market for just really good, dramatic, illustrative uh, stories and could tip me off if he saw anything. And he, he called and said, have you heard about this crazy thing happening down in the Southern Ocean? And I, I knew some of the Sea Shepherd guys, Peter Hammerset and Sid Chakavarti. And so I began harassing them and saying, I know you guys are already in the chase and you're not gonna come pick me up, but like, is there any way you can get me on board because I can, I can put this story on the front page of the New York Times. And um, uh, through sheer harassment, they eventually acquiesced and um, I got on board and, and then told that story. Um, uh, how to, but you brought a question and to your audience, you know, pitching stories. It's honestly, it's very tough to get stories placed as non-staff in the Times. And it's becoming tougher by the day, frankly, um, for lots of reasons. Um, there's a glut of, um, there's just not enough space. Anyway, there's lots of reasons. The economics are, of journalism is one of the reasons they just don't want to pay outsiders to do stuff that they could have insiders do. Uh, the the risk of, of errors and blowback and liability and made up stuff um, by non-vetted people. Um, I was an editor for a while at the Times and I was always very nervous about taking stuff from people I didn't know because how am I going to know for sure that that stuff is 
um, bulletproof, um, uh, accurate and, um, and, um, uh, yeah, so I, I, I think, um, uh, pitching pieces, normally how people get pieces, uh, freelancers, stringers, um, get pieces placed in the times, the magazine, they're, they're different entities, right? There's the magazine <clears throat> and they, they have a smaller, um, portion of staff and then run stuff by non-staff um the new side folks which is where i resided the, the paper itself um the bar is way higher for non-staff writing and typically if it's coming it's usually from stringers so those are folks who have been doing you know kind of um uh assistance work in breaking news capacities um grunt work really brutal grinding shit wages work um for a while and kind of earn their chops by doing that shit work and um uh and also just uh being around long enough to know certain norms that are unstated and what words you do or you don't use and how stories are framed and all these sorts of things that you can't know unless you've really been in, in it for a while and then some the, those stringers are usually the ones that will appear with bylines after a while um so well, thank you, Ian, for helping clarify my question. That was a much better way to address it. And I do think it's still really useful. A lot of us here are, you know, outside the traditional journalism industry. So that little bit of insight is actually really helpful. Um, thanks. And so Pete speaks very openly about his, uh, his relationships with media and kind of how to use uh, the media to tell stories about animals, specifically under, under undercover investigations. So Pete, I wonder if you could tell us a little bit about your Drift Nuts investigation, but um, my, my bigger question, and you've talked about this with us before, um, is this uh, cultural culture of cruelty that you've identified. Um, and yeah, I wonder how, uh, yeah, how do you tell stories about a culture that's so kind of violent and sometimes hard to look at? Um, and, and how do you use the media to help you do that? Absolutely. Um, so the, uh, that Driftnet case, um, it started when back in 2011, I had done some uh, undercover work on boats looking for federal violations, found state violations, no federal. The case wasn't released, but I used the experience so that uh, five years later, I could then start telling boats I want to get on. I'm a videographer and I know what to film and I know what not to film. And so the fact that I had that fishing background and I, I told them I wouldn't film their violations allowed me to get on with a covert camera and covertly document uh, the federal violations um, and uh, openly document the normal activity. Um, the case was chosen, um, basically I, I looked at the entire United States and said, all right, I'm gonna go get undercover on a fishing boat, what do I do? And I looked at Southern California and I said, okay, I've, I've worked on some boats out there, but what is the press going to care about? And I looked at all the bycatch. I had been on a, uh, uh, a dredge boat out on the East coast and saw the incredible amount of bycatch that came up dead, just thousands of animals just dying and crushed under their own weight, but they're not cute. You know, they're starfish, they're crabs, they're sand dollars. Um, and so when I, I looked at the drift gillnet fishery in Southern California or throughout California, it's a mile long net. They go for swordfish and dolphins and sea lions typically get caught in these nets uh, and they come up dead. Um, it had already been banned in Washington and Oregon. Uh, it had been unsuccessful efforts for years to ban it in California. And when I looked at that fishery, I thought, okay, that's the end for no other reason then that bycatch is cute. Swordfish are not, but dolphins and sea lions are. So if I get footage of that, the media will care. And if the media cares, we can pass a law to ban this, right? And then that validates welfare for fish as a concern in the public's mind. That's kind of like the, the big picture, right? So uh, yeah, I got on and um, uh, long story short, filmed you know dead sea lions and dead dolphins coming up in the nets. Um, and uh, then they did in fact turn around and passed a state law to, for mandatory buyouts of all permits for that fishery uh, to ban it. Um, the, the culture of cruelty thing where that comes in is that 
when you work a case like that, when you work any kind of an undercover case, the, the thing is you, you are seeing things. You can also see this if it's, if you're just say you're doing surveillance and people don't know they're being watched, but you see an operation when people believe there is no accountability for their actions, when they believe no one is watching. And it, in my, in my experience, 20 years of doing this, it never fails. You always see something that makes people look at the footage and say, why the hell did they do that? That makes no sense. That that's too risky for them. That cost them money that made their work harder. You know, um, why would they do that? And, uh, there is a variety of reasons for this, but the culture of cruelty is part of what it really comes down to. And it's that very briefly, I can go through this, is that when you, when, when you package a story like that for the press, you want to explain the why. The stress of the work environment, which Ian explains in his book, The Outlaw Ocean, very clearly the stress of the work environment on, on uh, commercial fishing vessels. Um, um, I explain that kind of stress of that work environment on puppy mills and, and rescue dogs, but it's and on fishing boats. It's, you know, it's very intense, right? There's immigration, there's felony status, right? And it goes far beyond that when you're talking about, uh, you know, if you're, if you're trafficked, as Ian explains in his books, right? You are not going to complain because there's a lot of repercussions to you and your family if you do, right? Um, uh, then there is law enforcement corruption is another thing and government corruption. And this, um, if there's anyone who's a member of law enforcement who's listening, has family or friends in law enforcement, look, I know there's, there, there's some great agents that handled the case that I worked on the Drift Gillnet thing, but when it comes to industrialized animal operations, apathy and corruption from law enforcement is unfortunately the norm, especially with local law enforcement, because that familiarity breeding apathy, that is true. But on my Drift Gillnet case, it was the feds that were handling it. It was Northern Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration and U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. They are not out there hanging out with these fishermen. They are not trying to ensure the health of the industry. NOAA is. NOAA was trying to, I'm sorry, NOAA was not, but, the, but California Fish and Game was. California Fish and Game wanted to make sure that that industry was going to thrive, right? And so when it came to a U.S. attorney's office to have NOAA and U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service looked at it, they simply looked at, this is evidence of crimes, how do we bust them? So we kind of had to bypass um, um, the, uh, the locals. And I, I remember as an example of what I saw on that, I was on a, uh, a, uh, a small long liner and the, uh, there was a California Fish and Game observer employed by the government to watch the catch as it came up. And on a typical line, you know, you'd have like 50 skates, which are which their small rays come up. And every time a skate came up, the captain would take a nut, grab the ray, take a knife, and cut the skate in half to kill it and throw it in the ocean. The 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 state state observer never reported one of those. In fact, he laughed at the captain's joke as he bragged about shooting and killing a sea lion on his boat, because that's just how things are at sea, right? Now, when you take all these things and you put them together you have what I call a culture of cruelty, right? Because this could be the puppy mills, could be the factory farm, this could be the fish farm, this could be the commercial fishing boat, it makes no difference. You are so used to seeing these violations, you are, and you know that the local cops don't care. You know that the government doesn't care, right? And you know that if you complain, there's repercussions for you and for other people. So it simply becomes the norm amongst you and amongst your community and amongst anyone who is responsible for enforcing the law and regulations on that industry to just simply let it go. And so it comes to, uh, uh, it, it, it comes to when you have to report on that, um, Ian, I know in your book, you mentioned this specifically where you're talking about, you kind of had a moment saying, man, you know, I'm, I'm just supposed to be looking at this objectively, but I find myself digging into this saying, how do I explain the problems behind this? Is that an agenda and is an agenda okay? The fact of the matter is if corruption is the norm and if destroying the environment and species depletion is the norm, then yeah, in a, obviously, you know, you did the right thing by writing a book about it because an agenda is absolutely right. So you went the way of, of Lex and I and went, went kind of activist on it, right? Um, but, but that is what people need. People need to understand not just what to think. They, it, it, it's a, 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 
I see the height of reporting is when a reporter can take that information from a case like that and explain to people how to think, how to understand, okay, if this is occurring, why does it occur? And where can I get the information to understand why that would happen and what I as a consumer can do about it? Did I answer your question or did I kind of derail? I think you-, you, you I, Go ahead. <laughs> I was just gonna say like, yeah, I think you more than answered, um, yeah, our questions. Um, that's awesome, thanks so much, Pete. Uh, I'm, I'm really sad that we only have like 15 minutes left. Um, I don't even know how that happened. We should have booked at least four or five hours. Um, my bad, <laughs> next time. Um, I've got one more question for each of you. Um, if you're able to keep it a little bit brief, um, then we can have some time for some audience Q&A as well. Um, but let me start with you, Lex. I would love you to give us one example of a story about industrialized fishing that you think is extremely important, but hasn't made it into mainstream media or it has, but it hasn't got enough attention. Gosh, <laughs> that's really difficult. I don't even know where to start with that one. Um, because obviously like a lot of my stories are gonna be from the Sea Shepherd perspective. I've spent time around the West Coast of Africa actually involved with enforcement teams and leading armed military officials to go and inspect fishing boats. And they did get a lot of coverage, these stories did. And, you know, I can't complain that our salmon investigation was covered in the Daily Mirror. And then we followed up with the Rainbow Trout investigation that was covered in the Times. And we have had some great success in getting coverage of these stories. And a lot of what Pete was saying resonates because I remember when we first were starting to look into doing the ice fish campaign, we'd just done campaign after campaign about, after campaign about protecting whales who are very easy to sell to the public and very easy to get behind in terms of a campaign to go and protect and defend them. But when you're then talking about these fish that live sort of 1500 meters below the surface that are almost prehistoric looking, they're incredibly ugly ice fish are, nobody even knows what they are. They're actually Chilean sea bass is how you would see them on the menu. And so they're very hard to relate to. And I know like with the salmon story that we were working on, it did take a number of weeks and a lot of pushing for us to get that story out there. And I think that that really just comes down to the fact that we don't relate very well to fish as, as we do to other species, whether that's because of a lack of facial expression or other more familiar and recognizable forms of communication, you know, body language, conversation, we can't talk to fish. And we know less about the deep sea than we do about space, for instance. And, you know, science is even telling us that the further the animals are away from us on the evolutionary chain, the less likely we are to attempt to protect them. So we spent, you know, a number of weeks trying to push this salmon story out and it just kept getting knocked back because, you know, I was praying that the queen wasn't going to be in an accident or and I'm not even a royalist, but it was like, I hope nothing happens to the queen. Otherwise that story is never going to get released because this is just always something else, you know. Harry and Meghan are just like on everything. I'm so glad we don't have an investigation about fish going out this week because we wouldn't get a look in. And it really is just because I think it happens, especially when you're talking about things at sea, it's so far removed from where we are. We don't see it every day. It's very difficult to get those kind of stories anyway. And yeah, we just we just don't like fish as much as we do other species that we, you know, we can cuddle and, and stroke and pet so yeah I think that that's the number one thing really to take away that it's just hard to get coverage on fish because we don't relate to them very well right so it's finding a way to make it more relatable whether it's the cute factor or anything else we can we can do to to get that message across um thanks Lex um Ian on to you and your book again I will hold it up just in case I get requested again. Um, so one of the things that really struck me and makes me feel like incredibly naive when I was reading it was um, this idea of factory farms at sea. Uh, so you describe conditions where people are working below deck, obviously processing all of the catch um, continuously in these really dangerous situations, which is something that even me, like as a vegan vegetarian, basically all my life, I'd never even considered that that was 
a thing like I never knew that that existed um I'm curious about your time at sea and all of the things that you uncovered was there anything like does one thing stand out as something that like shocked you or that you didn't think was happening um well I have an answer for your other question um uh you can answer <laughs> that instead if you story. like <laughs> um but uh the shocking wow I mean it was five years of lots of shocking stories um you're mostly interested in ocean um I mean well maybe actually the two things converge so that when I looked at the notes of our discussion plan I I looked at this question of story ideas yet to tackle that you'd love to tackle or someone should and one of a long list of them I mean, we're still producing stories you know six eight a month um a year um one story i'd, I'd love to do is i'd love to take a, a really great videographer um uh, you know and open up a map and find 10 locations in the world where high-tech fads are being used fish aggregating devices and um you know put pins on a map and then go out to those fads and drop a time lapse camera under the water and film the aggregation of of large amounts of fish there and and really kind of almost in a wired you know i would take this to the new yorker or new york times magazine or wired or and um make it a really video rich story where you can see the 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 you know kind of the growing population of fish that are coming to that you know site and then also dissect the equipment that sits on the top that transmits the signal to the guy sitting, you know, the captain sitting in a bar in Songla, Thailand or wherever. And um, kind of just like say, okay, this is, this antenna is used for this purpose and, you know, really break it down. And then the time lapse would show more and more fish and then sit, park, wait. And I mean, this would take a long time, but for the guys to show up and net them and make the point that, you know, this is no longer hunting. This is agriculture. You know, they're, they're not like chasing fish. They're just rounding them up. And technology is working in this way to uh, put the industrial scale problems, unsustainable problem on steroids. And this is one tool that is being massively deployed that um, most people don't know about. And it's really weird and cool and futuristic and dark. You know, I think that'd be a fun story. It'd take a shitload of time. And, uh, but, um, it's totally doable, you know, and it would make an amazing set of videos just to see what those are like. So, you know, uh, that would be a story I would, I'd probably do in the next couple of years. Great. Thank you. Um, that's really interesting. I never even thought about that either. Um, so <laughs> that was awesome to hear. Um, Pete, I guess um, I will ask you the same question. Um, what have you seen or witnessed that, uh, like, in regards to commercial fishing um, or fishing uh, illegal fishing um, that you think should be covered in the media that needs to get more attention? Um, I would say that uh, the uh, number one is the amount of bycatch that exists in most fisheries. Um, uh, I on, on the dredge boat that I was on, um, simply the pure amount of, you know, dogfish and monkfish and starfish and everything else that came up. Um, what, what struck me was not just the amount of fish that came up dead for scallops. It was that they would get piled up, crushed beneath their own weight, and then they would be left to suffocate before they were thrown back in the ocean simply for, for laziness. Um, and that, you know, at one point I remember I saw so many, so many scallops came up that, uh, and, and then there was no rain. The sun baked the catch for three days. And so thousands of animals just died and were just baked in the sun right there, right? And it, it, so that was not the most shocking thing. The most shocking thing was that I had told the crew I'm a videographer and I'm blatantly holding a camera out. I did not have to use my undercover camera that entire nine day trip. They did not care that I filmed all of it. They didn't care that I was filming them shoveling dead fish into the ocean, filming them all just compiling on. It was simply par for the course. It was perfectly normal. Um, um, the, the, the other thing is that while, while the sea lions and the dolphins, while that was shocking, you know, to, I think to a lot of people to see like, oh man, they're all coming up dead. Um, 
you know, when you look at, you go to the Northern Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration reports and you look for when they've had federal observers, right? And they don't have that many animals coming up dead in that short amount of time of what I saw, right? But when there's set gill nets, which each of those is a quarter mile long, placed down in the ocean, you go for different kinds of fish in Southern California, you go for like sea bass, right? Um, I was on one of those boats for six days. Um, what I saw was in six days, I saw 76 dead Brant's cormorants come up in the nets. That is more dead birds than NOAA had documented in about a decade previous to that for all birds in that entire area. Um, and so, you know, um, the, the, the thing that I was happy about with the case was, okay, you know, there's a banned fishery. But the thing that I'm still struggling with is to make that point to the public to try to get the, you know, to figure out how the press could have picked it up to say, this uncovers a problem that all of the federal observers, every, every policy that we have in place to document this is falling short and that the problem is far greater. And of course, the problem with that is that the implication is severe, right? So uh, I think that's, those are the most uh, shocking things. Thank you. Um, okay, I would love to keep talking about all of these issues um, the three of you have brought up, uh, but we're drawing to the end somehow. So uh, I'm just going to take a couple of questions from the audience. Um, one, the first one is a question for Ian. Um, how did you go from getting a PhD to working in the New York Times? Was that always the plan? Yeah, plan isn't a word that really sits in my... Um, uh, backstory. Um, no, so uh, I'll be very quick. So in 60 seconds, I had no clue what I wanted to do. I went into grad school because I only started paying attention in undergrad, like senior year. And I was like, wait, this interesting stuff happens in classes. So then I got my shit together and realized, hey, maybe I should double down on this. Uh, went for history, merged into ant culture anthropology. Didn't want to be a professor, didn't like that lifestyle but did like the life of the mind. Um, I had worked for an investigative reporter as an undergrad as his sort of coffee researcher, you know, unpaid intern. And um, that whetted my appetite for what that work looks like. Was five years in grad school, specialized on Cuba, went and lived in Cuba. Um, but I um, really realized that I wanted to do writing and, but I wanted to do it more caffeinated and with a bigger readership and, and really aimed at driving social change. And so I thought, okay, I gotta get out of the academy and get into journalism. So I bailed on the doctoral and started writing freelance for magazine, tapping that guy I used to work for as an undergrad saying, hey, if you get interest from magazines to do something, could you toss me the story? I'll do a good job, you can make sure it's okay. And then you know, the editors will get what they want, but you'll not have to do it. And so I did that for a couple of years, worked on the Middle East, and um, so two years of publishing uh, in that fashion as a pure freelance. And uh, then I applied to everyone under the sun and I got very lucky in that the New York Times and a couple other places offered me a job. Um, uh, so it's not a path that makes sense, nor I think this day and age could, could be followed by most others. Um, normally you get a job at the Times because you've worked at, um, legacy venues, you know, for a bunch of years before you've won some big award and they poach you that kind of thing. I came in through, uh, hey, this guy's an oddball and he's written some stuff. We'll train him up how to do breaking news. And so that's what they did. Nice. Thank you very much. Um, Lex, a quick one for you. I don't know if you could do this quickly, actually. Um, somebody wants to know about your anti-whaling campaigns and if you're able to give a very short description of what it's like to be on the front line of a campaign like that. Yeah, I don't, <laughs> I don't think there's a quick answer to that one at all. Um, I mean, the thing with the whaling campaigns were specifically we were targeting the Japanese whaling fleet that were operating in Antarctica despite a global moratorium on commercial whaling they were actually exploiting a loophole that allowed them to take whales for scientific purposes. And, you know, for them, some of these scientific purposes were to count the rings on a whale's earplug so they knew how old it was, for instance, and you can only do that once the whale's dead. And, and that's kind of 
ridiculous research because you're killing an animal just to find out how old it is. But those those campaigns, I mean, I wouldn't say watch whale wars and it's exactly like <laughs> like that because a lot of the whale wars drama is obviously played up and you know things that would happen maybe a couple of hours would turn into three episodes or something and they'd really build the drama of it because Antarctica is a really long way away from anywhere you spend an awfully long time transiting there to start with you spend an awfully long time with binoculars at your eyes looking for anything in the water if you can see any whale guts in the water is a key indicator that the whaling fleet might be close you're constantly pouring over charts to see where the ice is built up where there might be krill blooms and things like that um, to indicate where the whaling fleet might operate and then obviously like there were some pretty intense confrontations that we had with the whaling fleet as you know I've, I've spoken to various mariners and a lot of them have never experienced a lot of the things that I have like collisions at sea I've seen a ship sink which was the thunder which you can read about in Ian's book <laughs> um you know and there's just a lot of these things that nobody would ever get to experience but here we were in one of the re most remote places in the world having these intense confrontations and sometimes it could be like nine ships involved and you know some of these whaling vessels would be towing these defensive lines crossing our bow to try and entangle our wooden propeller they were trying to essentially disable the ships so it's just like this constant battle and you always had to kind of be on guard ready for when something was going to happen but then at the same time there was a lot of downtime and there was a lot of just searching and you know everyday monotony which is is why i like the very regimented this is my structured day and this is what i'm going to do but i i've got so many stories and i'm more than happy to talk to anybody about them so you can always just reach out get in touch with me and i'll, I'll happily share some of those with you as well away from this webinar today Thank you, Lex. Appreciate that. Um, and we have one more question, if um, you all are able to stay, which is for Pete. Um, so Pete, you uh, and I know this having, you know, spent time speaking to you, uh, obviously before this, but how do you retain your amazing humanity while seeing what you're seeing? Uh, how do you not get sucked into the culture of cruelty? Um, it's a good question. Uh... So number one, I listen to a lot of Slipknot. Um, that really helps a lot. <laughs> um, and uh, number two, um, when I'm not in the field, I volunteer uh, with animal shelters. And that is that is huge because that really, um, it, it does two things. Uh, number one, it helps me to kind of let go and, and remember there's something I can do at this individual level. And that's what I'm asking everyone else to do, right? And that helps, and it also helps to humble me um, because um, you know, uh, if I've ever had anything, it's been like a big case and, uh, the activist community wants to pat me on the back. I like to go to a place where people don't know who I am. And my job is just to, uh, uh, just scrape the, you know, poop out of, uh, old, uh, litter trays. So, um, that's, that's the most useful thing. <laughs> Great. Well, uh, yeah, so scraping the poop out of litter trays is a good place to end it. Um, do you, any of uh, our three speakers have anything that they would like to add as we wrap up here? Are there any final thoughts that you have? You're good. <laughs> um, thank you all so much for your time. Uh, and thanks to all our attendees and all your questions. Sorry we couldn't get to them all today. Um, but yeah, to be continued, we'll definitely reconvene at some point. It's been fascinating to hear your stories. Um, and thank you all for, for joining us.